Hey guys, good morning. Good morning, guys. It is, uh, it's great to be with you guys. I feel like I've been gone for a few days, but like I was on gone only 24 hours. Um, <laughs> But we did a lot in 24 hours. We got to go down to Indiana, uh, to the great Indy Church. Uh, they had their Women's Day yesterday. Uh, it was incredible as uh, God gave them 80 in attendance for that. Uh, there were two women that were baptized at their Women's Day. Yes. And then I know many of us were there. Uh, I know all the sisters went down and, and they spoke and they said. Let's go, Amber. Let's go, Kenny. I heard Amber. I heard Amber, you know, especially did a great job yesterday. Of course, Kaya and Kennedy, uh, they sang with uh, those angelic voices that they have. And, uh, you know, my wife was a trooper. Let's go, Julie. Uh, she was kind of running the show down there. And they got done. Just so you know, they got done at 8.30 last night. And, uh, you know, my wife drove all the way back from Indianapolis to Detroit. And I got back at 1 in the morning, but she'd never know it. She's super excited to be here with all of us today. Let's go see um, Let's go see yeah, she just had to come see Samaj, you know. Welcome yes. back. And uh, guys, it has been an encouraging service so far. I want to thank you for visiting with us today, for being here uh, with us. And uh, you're part of the family already. You'll probably get a few hugs today. Yes. yes. Hope you don't mind. Love um, it's and it's great having Samaj back. In the Welcome home, because this is your home. So it's great, great to be with you guys. You guys, turn to Psalm 55. Psalm 55, we'll get into our lesson today. The title of my lesson is The Running Man. The Running Man. No, I'm not talking about the dance from the 90s, nor am I going to do it. But we're going to talk about Jonah this morning. You know, there's an old Southwest Airlines commercial. We love Southwest. Yeah, we love Southwest. <laughs> and the whole thing was, want to get away? And uh, they're, they're great. They're, they're funny commercials. Just commercials that really center around awkward moments. Oh, not awkward moments. And then right at the key time, they're like, hey, you, you want to get away? And, uh, you know, this one commercial was based out of Detroit. And it had this guy, you know, singing, doing a concert. And at the end of the concert, he's like, it's great to be with you guys here in Detroit. And the crowd gets silent. Oh. And they're like, Detroit. And his bandmate goes, that was yesterday. We're in Chicago. And he's like, oh. And then he's like, want to get away? I'm good. And, uh, you know, there's moments like that in life where you just want to get away. Yeah. And uh, you ever been in a, sa a situation where you wanted to run? Yeah. Where you're just dealing with, with so something so tough. That you just wanted to get away and go someplace else. Well, let's read here in Psalm 55. David was feeling like that. In verse 4. The Bible says, My heart is in anguish within me. Tears of death have fallen on me. Fear and trembling have come upon me. Horror has overwhelmed me. David's having a bad day. I said, Oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would just fly away. And be at rest. I would flee far away. And I would stay in the desert. You know you're hurting oh. when you'd rather be in a desert than anywhere else. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he says, I would hurry off to my place of shelter far from the tempest and the storm. Maybe, have you ever wanted just to get away? You ever want, felt like you just had, you're on the run, running from something, something that was troubling you, overwhelming you, or challenging you? Up, Maybe that's your week. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Troubled, overwhelmed, and challenged. Oh, goodness, bro. Goodness me. Well, you know, here in Psalm 55, goodness me. David writes of a time where he just wanted to get away. And he said, you know, my heart is in anguish. My heart is pain. He says, I'm overwhelmed. He said, if I could just be a dove, I would fly away, far away from here. And go to the desert. It's great to have Daniel back from the yeah. desert. Yeah. Daniel, Daniel and Lennox, they went to Las Vegas, Ooh. literally the desert. Yeah. They're back here with us. Lennox is online. She's not feeling well today. So send, send your love uh, to Lennox. And by the way, guys, it is, it, today is uh, Rakia's spiritual birthday. Yes. Whoa! 
what? <laughs> Daniel, this is your spiritual birthday today, too. Whoa! Come on, guys. Yeah. yeah, boy. Make sure you love up on Daniel a little He's bit this more. Yeah. Daniel's five years old spiritually today. Uh, Rakia just turned one. Yeah. She was baptized last year at our Women's Day last year. Yeah. So going back to our lesson here, David was like, hey, I just want to be like enough. I want to fly away, run far away, far from, he says, the tempest and the storm. You know, sometimes we go through these, these tough situations in life, and sometimes they're not just physical challenges that we're going through. It's the emotional challenges that sometimes are the most daunting. Sometimes, you know, those emotional challenges, those heart challenges... And God is, he's calling us. He'll never tell you, he'll never encourage you to run away from him. He always wants us to face our giants. Sometimes we, we want to run, we just want to get away. When God is calling us to face certain things in our lives, calling us to deal with certain things. And God always calls us though to follow him and to do great things for him. And it's a journey. And God's going to ask you and call you to face many giants, fight many battles. And most of, most of the battles you fight, let me tell you, are ones with yourself. Yes. And the temptation when, when you see those challenges, when you see those giants that you need to face, the temptation that you will have is to run. Because it's in our nature to run from what's difficult, to run from the challenging, to get away. But no matter where you run or what you run to, You'll find that once you get there, the problem still exists. Oh, whoa. Because you're still there. <laughs> Wherever you run, you're there. And sometimes you run in circles. Because God just wants you to face that which you're running from. And overcome. And to answer his call and to grow. So let's go to Jonah chapter 1. Let's look at the, the original, the OG running man. Now very interesting as we looked in Psalm 55. You know, David says, I want to be like a dove. Jonah, his name means dove. Wow. That's what his name means. His name means dove. He actually did what Psalm 55 says. But... He was, you know, as it says in Psalm 55, trying to run from the storm, he ran into a storm. The running man. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. We're just going to break this one down. And I think you guys will relate. I did. Everybody there? Yeah. I'll never lie. I'll lie, bro. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh. And preach against it. Because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away. He didn't even have a conversation with God. Dang. He didn't even pray about it. He just ran away. He ran away from the Lord and he headed for Tarshish. We're going to talk about where that is in a minute. Okay. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare... He went aboard, and he sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Mm. You know, here we have the prophet Jonah in a case of a prophet defection. <laughs> it's actually the only case where I've ever read about where a prophet completely ran from God. Wow. And here, literally, God tells Jonah very specifically what he wanted him to do, a very specific task. And he says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh which were the Assyrians, and I want you to preach to them. And Jonah just, he just did the, he said no. He didn't say the word, but you can always tell by someone's actions when they're telling God no. <laughs> just let that sit there for a minute. You don't actually have to say the word no to tell God no. He ran the other way. He ignored God's call. He was the Lord's anointed. He was a prophet. And God called him to go, like, actually do his job. Go preach. <laughs> and he attempted to run away. And I say attempted because it, he didn't get very far. <laughs> you can never outrun God. He's faster than you. 
God can be everywhere all at once. <laughs> he's always five steps ahead of you. You'll be running, looking back to see if he's following, and you run into God. Oh, <laughs> a couple of lessons I've learned in my life. A couple of lessons I've learned. You can run from the you can run from the call, but you can't outrun the caller. You can run from the call, but you can't outrun the call. Number two, you never run from God and end up in a better place. That's the second lesson, a hard one. Hard one. Hard one I've learned. You can never run from God and end up in a better place. Now here's the facts. All of us run. Yeah. Some of us run longer. Some of us are sprinters, some are marathoners. Some of us run harder and faster than others, but we all run in different ways. Some of in different ways. Some of us we run to sin. And we run to sin to ignore the call of God. We ignore the call of God when he calls us to change something that's running. Some of us refuse to pray. Refuse to read our Bibles. That's running. You're not saying the word no, but you're but you are. Jonah teaches us a lot of lessons when we get into this. Main lesson is just answer the call. Yeah. It'll go very it'll go so much easier for you when you just answer God's call. It's so much more delightful and exciting when you just answer the call. But Jonah would rather resign his calling than to do God's will. He turned it in. He turned it in his profit badge. Dang. He said, I'm, I'm out of here. So what would cause Jonah to give God the stiff arm? <laughs> Well, same reason we do it. Oh, oh. <laughs> he didn't like God's plan. Dang. Oh. He thought he had a better idea. <laughs> In Jonah 4.2, it actually, we're not going to read it. You can go back and look study this out later. Jonah 4.2, uh, Jonah actually reveals why he ran. He didn't want God to save them. He didn't want God to save the Assyrians. He didn't like them. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to talk about why in a minute, but... Yeah. He, bottom line, he didn't like the Ninevites, the Assyrians. He didn't like them at all. He didn't like the call. So he was torn between his loyalty to God and his loyalty to his emotions. Ooh. And he chose his emotions. So the Ninevites, you know, he, these people that he was called to go preach to, um, it's an ancient Assyrian city. Little, little, some facts here, some history. Um, it would be known as northern Iraq today. Mm. And for about a 50-year period, around 700 B.C., it was the largest city in the world, Nineveh. In Jonah 3, verse 3, it tells us that it would take an entire day, or an entire three days, for someone to go through Nineveh. That's how big the city was. Populated by the Assyrians, and it would have been the last place Jonah would want to go. The last place. The Israelites were heavily persecuted by the Assyrians. And these were a very ruthless people. They were actually known for their cruelty. That's what they were known for. Not their encouragement. No. <laughs> their cruelty. Amen. History records that the Assyrians were among the most ruthless nations to ever exist. And I even read several sources that believe that the practice of crucifixion itself originated by the Assyrians. Wow. So think about that. God literally is sending a prophet to preach to the very people that would invent the exact cause of death of the Son of God. Wow. Dang. Okay. God said, Jonah, I want you to go preach to them. Jonah's like, no. <laughs> Jonah was so unwilling to go preach to the Ninevites that when God called him to go preach to them, he literally went in the opposite direction. Wow. He didn't even try to make like he was going in the right direction. He went the opposite. You got to understand. Okay, if here's a map. Jonah was like in the middle, Joppa. God called him to go to Nineveh, which was over here. And he goes over here to Tarshish. <laughs> he didn't even try to make it look like he was obeying. <laughs> he was like, God's like, go here. And he's like, not going to happen. And he gets on a, a ship and he goes to Tarshish. Jonah gets ang in Jonah chapter 4, Jonah actually gets angry with God for showing them compassion. Mm. Wow. Wow. Think about that. So basically, here's why he ran the other way. Tell us. I don't want you to forgive them. Mm. 
He knew that if he preached to them, they would re repent. He was so driven by his emotions. So what do we learn here? We run when we don't like God's call. We run when we don't agree with God's call. And we run when the call exposes something in our hearts that we don't want to deal with. Jonah didn't want to forgive. That was the root of his issues. Go read Jonah 4. And he knew that God would show them mercy. He was so bitter that he would rather resign his calling than to just forgive and preach to them. Wow. We run when we don't want to change our hearts. We run from the things we do not want to do. And we run from the things we don't like to do. You know how the gym fills up the first two weeks of the year? <laughs> <laughs> and then the next, you know, the next 11 months of the year, there's, it's like not very many people in there. Exactly. We run from the things that are challenging to us. The emotionally challenging things. And we run from things that push us. We run from things that scare us. Mm, facts, bro. And Jonah was wrestling with all of these things. And it says that when he ran, he just happened to find a ship headed for Tarshish. Now, you have to understand, Tarshish, I like to look up the meaning of names and words. Yeah. Jonah means of. Tarshish means gem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful gem. Yes. That's what it means. And he's like, that sounds pretty good. Let's go there. <laughs> it looked a lot better to him. Beautiful gem, Tarshish. It looked a lot better to him than Nineveh. What's the point? Satan will always make sin look good. Oh, come on, bro. He will always make whatever you're running to when you're running from God look great. Wow. He'll make running from God attractive. Sure will. So when you want to run from God, he's going to provide a handsome boy, a pretty girl, <laughs> impurity, ex-boyfriend. Mm. Immorality, mm. more money. <laughs> Satan knows your number. Yeah, he'll provide a Tarshish professionally made for you. Dang. <laughs> and he'll make it look great. And like Jonah, there's going to be a boat waiting for you. The boat was just there waiting. The devil will always make sure that there's a boat for you. Mm. He loves it when people run from God. The devil loves it when people run away from their calling and run from it. And, you know, when you get on that boat that Satan provides, it'll be smooth sailing for a second. Oh, but you will pay the fare. Oh, my God. Come on, bro. <laughs> you know, if you've been running, make today the day that you stopped running from God. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a decision. Make today the day that you listen to the call of God. And today, the day that you surrendered to your calling. Come on, bro. Make today the day that you stopped running and answered the call. Amen? Amen. Y'all yeah, want to lift up the marriage ministry for a minute? Yeah. You know, the, the, the married ministry doesn't get enough love. Let me just tell you. We always lift up the campus. And, you know, the campus are a bunch of zealous warriors. Yeah. And they are. They're incredible. Come on. Okay, but I, I want to lift on, up the marriage ministry. You know, we got married a few of campus. us here in the marriage ah, ministry. Married uh, of course, we got Rakia. She's in our marriage ministry. Yeah. Yeah. We got uh, the Munizas, Umberto and Sasha. Yeah. They're online today. We got the Durants. Yeah. Come on, man. Hey, Daniel, the, the newly married Durants. Wow. Well, it's, been, it's been about a year, I guess. Close. We got we got the fabulous Medus. Where you at? Ooh, we got the they're, they're taking care of our children, and then of course we got Cosmos and Nikki. And uh, you know, this week you know I had a great talk with Nana in our in our discipling time, and, and uh, you know we just talked about the marriage ministry, and, and, and our our belief is that and the marriage ministry want to do great things for God. So we talked about and we schemed about how to make that happen. Because they want to answer God's call too. Yes, let's go. It was very inspiring this week, you know, uh, at our men's midweek Cosmos. He did the welcome. Yeah, he mm. did. He killed it, bro. And let me welcome. tell you, man. Cosmos whipped out a song and uh, just about praising God. And he read that scripture with conviction. Everybody was like dancing, fired up. And he was just doing the welcome. I thought, man, this guy's preaching. And everybody was so fired up, you know. And I thought, I thought, man, this guy's got some passion in there. 
We're all fired up listening to the song, and I'm thinking in my head, you guys better watch out. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> you young guys on campus, you think you know something. Uh, no. <laughs> Cosmos has been in more Bible studies than you can even attempt in uh, class. Uh, Two years you've been a Christian. Come on, bro. Let's go, bro. Come this guy, I thought, man, this guy's got some fire in him. And he's got, he's got some zeal and knowledge. Woo! All right, so watch out. You know, this marriage, you guys just... You guys wait. The marriage ministry here is going to turn it on. And you young bucks are going to be learning from some of these warriors like Cosmos and Nana. And all of them. Amen? But I just want to, that's just a little shout out there to the marriage ministry. Go to Jeremiah chapter 1. But, but keep your place. Keep your place. I want to finish this point here about running from your call uh, before we move on to our next one. You know, God's got a great plan for you. A great calling in store. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4, I love the calling of Jeremiah. The Bible says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I love that. God, God has known you before you were even born. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm too young. You must go to everyone, even the Ninevites. You must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them. I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Now I believe very much, just like Jeremiah, God has called everybody here to an incredible destiny. Yeah. As a prophet to the nations or a prophetess to the nations. God has called every disciple here literally to play a part in changing the world one person at a time. But you have to answer the call. Some of us kind of tiptoe around the call. We walk away. We run away from the call. But God has called you to something incredible. You've got to embrace the call and stop running from it and embrace it wholeheartedly. Point number two, you can run, but you can't hide. Go back to Jonah, chapter 1, verse 4. You can run, but you can't hide. You're going to run right into God. In Jonah, chapter 1, verse 4. So now Jonah's on the run. It says he just, he didn't even talk with God. He just, get, he just gets on the boat, and he's running and fleeing, it says. Flee means great haste. Like he flee. He didn't, he didn't even try to walk away. He just fleed. Now let's see what happens here in verse 4. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. You see, you're running from a storm. God will send you into a big one. <laughs> and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each one cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down, and he fell into a deep sleep. Some people just sleep, try to sleep away their problems. Oh, I've been there, bro. <laughs> That's what he's doing. He's just, maybe I'll sleep through it. Come on, God. Verse 6, the captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up. Get up. This is some of our quiet times in the morning. Get up. The spirit's like, get up. And call on your God. Maybe he'll take notice of us so that we will not perish. You know, Jonah, he gets on the ship. He's running. He's fleeing from God, headed for Tarshish. It says he falls into a deep sleep. Trying to escape the call. And it was smooth sailing for a minute. And then here's the storm. Not just any storm either. The storm sent by God. The perfect storm. You know, God has sent many storms in my life. In the form of trials. Times in my life where I was headed in the wrong direction. God provided a perfect storm. To turn me around. Financial storms. To teach me that I can't rely on money. Wow. Relational storms. To teach me I can't make people my God. Mm. Health storms. To humble me. Yeah. To turn me around. Sometimes I go through ministry storms. Mm. So that God will teach me I have to rely on him and not talent. Yeah. Nice. But there's one thing that I've learned in every storm. It was always meant to get me to turn around. Mm. Slow down, turn around and go back to him. To quit running. And to walk with God. Running makes you tired. For real. Yeah. Talk about it. 
And when you run from God, you'll learn pretty quick, I can't keep this pace up. And I have a question. Wouldn't you just rather walk with God than run from him? It's so much easier. Micah 6 eight says, what does God require of you? To walk humbly with your God. Wow. But some of us would just rather like marathon all the time. Run from God instead of walking with him. I'm like, I can tell who's been running. You look really tired. You just ran a 26.2 man and you're like... <laughs> I just barely made it. Yeah. We run, God sends a storm, and then here's the thing, the storm, it wasn't designed to kill him. It was designed to stop him, to turn him around, to save him, actually. Sometimes we look at the trials, we look at the storms as God's just, you know, disciplining us, and he's mad at us, when no, he's like, I'm trying to save you, actually. If you kept running and you actually could see what you're about to run into. And so he stops us and he turns us around. You know, sometimes when you go through these life storms, it just, it's what you need to get you to pray. Yeah. Come on, bro. To get you to pray and wrestle with God for your faith. You know, there's one of my, one of my favorite movies is Forrest Gump. Yeah. yeah. Come on, Come on And uh, there's a scene in Forrest Gump where everybody knows Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> this is Forrest Gump's best friend. They met in the army, and Lieutenant Dan, he, he, gets, he goes through an explosion and loses both legs. And he wanted to die in battle. That was like his ambition. And uh, Forrest Gump saves him, carries him all, all the way back to the plane, saves his life. And so now Lieutenant Dan is just bitter. Why did you save me? And uh, he made a promise that if Forrest Gump ever started a shrimp boat, he would go back and he would run, help Forrest run the shrimp boat. You know? And so he goes back and he's with Forrest and they're not catching any shrimp. And, all, and they're in the middle of a storm one night and Lieutenant Dan is just mad at God. And he like tethers himself to the mast. You know? And he's up there and the wind's blowing. Forrest Gump is like inside of the ship trying to steer it, you know. <laughs> Lieutenant Dan is just having it out with God, like, ah, just a bit of rage. And finally, he like, he wrestles with God, he gets through it, and then they start catching a bunch of shrimp, you know, and then Lieutenant Dan is like at peace the rest of the movie. And I think for us, sometimes we just need to tether ourselves to the mast. Mm, wow. And wrestle with God. Come on, bro. Until you overcome. Wow. Sometimes it's a storm, I guess, it's to deal with our relationship with God. Go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Here's what the Bible says about storms, how you should think about them. James chapter 1. Now we're going to go back to Jonah, so keep your finger. Yes, sir. James chapter 1 verse 2 says, consider it pure joy. What do you consider pure joy? Like, I usually think about vacation, Costa Rica, a bunch of encouragement. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. What? Did I read that right? Yeah. Trials. Right. Come on, and pure man. joy, that doesn't, that doesn't equate. Mm, the math he says, because you know, do you know this, right? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work. That means you actually have to go through the storm. Oh, jeez. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. See, the real storm is internal. Wow. <laughs> doubt. Yeah. Wow. That's the real storm. Do you believe that God will get you through this? Do you mm. believe that God will be on the other side waiting, will walk with you, help you, teach you? He says that person should not expect, when you doubt, right? Verse 7, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person, person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. You know, the real storm I've learned, and the, the biggest storm you'll ever go through is that internal storm. And we got to learn to calm the real storm within, which is doubt. Yeah. Doubt is described as an internal storm that tosses you around and all over the place. And this is the storm that God doesn't send. Mm. Mm. Doubt is the storm of Satan. Wow. Dang. It's the first tactic that he used on Eve. Did God really say that? Wow. 
Doubt is the storm of Satan. It's meant to kill you. It's meant to destroy your faith. And we all must master the storm of doubt. You know, it's like the story I once heard of a Native American chief teaching his grandson a life lesson. And he said, grandson, there are two wolves inside of you. One is faith and one is fear and doubt. And they are at war with each other. And the grandson, grandson looks up to his grandfather and says, which one wins? And the old Cherokee chief says, the one that you feed. We got to feed our faith and not our fears. Yeah. Mm. Three practicals to feed your faith. Come on, bro. Let's go. And I'll go through these quickly, and then we're going to go back to Jonah chapter 1. Let's Three go, practicals to feed your faith. Number one, read your Bible daily. Facts. Don't take a day off. Mm. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Amen. Memorize scripture. Mm. Psalm 119, 11 says, I have hidden God's word in my heart. Nice. I have a question. What's the biggest battle you're facing right now? What's the biggest doubt that you have? What's the biggest storm that you're going through right now? Now, how many scriptures do you have memorized to fight that storm? When Jesus was attacked daily in Luke chapter 4 by the devil, he fought back with scripture that he had memorized. Wow. Okay. Number two, pray daily. In Philippians 4, and I'm not talking about like praying before your food. I'm talking about like, like praying day, like pouring out your soul. 1 Peter 5 says, I cast all of my anxiety onto God because he cares. Not like one of your anxieties. All of them. We try to cast our anxieties onto people. God, God's like, hey, I want to hear about all of your anxiety. But when you try to cast all of your anxieties onto people, guess what happens? They flee from you. <laughs> not because they don't love you, but they're like, I, they're not equipped to handle hearing all of your anxieties. But God is. That's why we have prayer. In Philippians 4, 6, the Bible says, do not be anxious about anything. You realize God says there's nothing ever that you'll go through in life that you should be anxious about? He says, don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. You know, when I'm not praying, I'm anxious about everything. Same. Yeah. Me too, bro. My wife can tell, too. Just a couple days ago, we were, like, talking, and she's feeling fear and doubt and anger and all kinds of emotions from me. Anxiety. She's like, hey, th did you pray today? No. <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> I had a lame prayer today. Thank you very much. <laughs> I just had to be humble. Let's go, bro. Come on, lead the way. But you can tell, man. The third thing is the third practical is daily openness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just being open. James five sixteen says, "Confess your sins to one another, so that you'll be healed." You know, guilt and shame are Satan's tactics to steal your joy. Mm. And your desire to walk with God. Guilt actually is the fuel for the runner. Wow. Oh. <laughs> you hear what I said there? Oh. Repeat guilt. It. Repeat that, bro. Guilt is the fuel <laughs> for the runner. It'll keep you running. Mm. Wow. Hey, that's, that's It'll awesome. keep you going. Come on. Guilt is the fuel. And see, you, you gotta be strong in the grace. God forgives you. You gotta like just turn around, be open. You know, the Bible says when we're open with each, with each other, we find healing, not condemnation, mm. healing. Mm. Those are the three practicals. Amen? Amen. Now go back to James chapter 1. Come on, bro. James, uh, I'm sorry, Jonah chapter 1. Even better, Come on, baby. Even better bro. Jonah chapter 1. You had a good question. <laughs> I'll just read this. In James 1.12, the Bible says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. So meaning, blessed is the one, happy is the word, is the one who perseveres through the storm. Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. You gotta keep your eye on the prize. Thanks. Now let's bring it to a close. Jonah chapter 1, verse 7. Nice. Let's on, see bro. how this story ends for Jonah. Ooh. Jonah's running. Now he's asleep. Mm. Now the ship is threatening to break up. Ooh. Everybody's freaking out. And that's another sub point I'm gonna talk about today is that our sin doesn't just affect us, it affected everybody on the boat. Oh, wow. Sometimes we think our, our sin, our mistakes just affects us. No, it affects everybody. 
Jonah 1 verse 7, the Bible says, Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let's cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell to Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What's your country? What people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord. The God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? Because they knew he was <laughs> running from God. Because he had already told them that. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men, they did their best to row back to land. But they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you, Lord. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and they threw him overboard. Mm. Yeah. Bye -bye. And then the raging sea grew calm. <laughs> At this, the men greatly feared the Lord. And they offered sacrifices to the Lord and they made vows to him. He, like, converted the whole ship. <laughs> I'm dead. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days right. and for three nights. You know, they throw him overboard. Essentially, he's now overwhelmed by it all. He's in the water. Literally swallowed up. Literally. And all he can do is pray. You ever get to those moments? Man, yeah. you're yeah. overwhelmed, swallowed up by everything, and all you can do is pray. Yeah. Yeah. And now we're going to read the most special part, his prayer, in Jonah mm -hmm. chapter 2. Wow. Usually your best, pr your best prayers are when you're completely surrendered. Totally. Yeah. Those are not usually always. Your best prayers are when you're completely surrendered to God and you're completely humble. When you stop running and all you can do is just pray. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's read his prayer. My last point, put the idol down. Nice. Ooh. You got that one? Uh -oh. Yeah, on, bro. I do, bro. Idol in the hand. I do. Put it down. Okay. Let go. Put the idol down. Jonah's prayer, Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very hearts of the seas. I, I love how he says, God, you hurled me into the depths. He didn't blame the guys. He said, you, you did this. Sometimes we blame people for our situations. I just have to point that out. He says, God, you, you made this happen. He says, you hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas. And the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet, I will look again. Hope. He still was hopeful. That's important. I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. <laughs> wow. That's just rough. <laughs> it's wrapped around him. Choking him. He says, verse 6, To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord, my God, brought my life up from the pit. Wow. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice. With, with what I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Wow. You know, Jonah is in the belly of a well, having a good prayer. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he could do. There before. <laughs> and we all need to get to that place where you're just completely surrendered. And all you have is prayer. You know, it's awesome to see that unique is in me getting baptized. <laughs> Unique is just, she's been going after her walk of God. I haven't been in the studies, but all the sisters have been sharing amazingly about Unique and how she's just completely surrendered to God's call in her life. Nobody enters the waters of baptism unsurrendered. Right. You make Jesus your Lord. Till death do you part, literally. And that's the vow that we make. And it's going to be awesome to see her united with God today. 
But that's what God asked. He asked for complete surrender. And that's where we all must get, is that place of complete surrender. And there's a difference between being caught and surrendering. Oh. <laughs> you guys ever seen the movie Cops? <laughs> or the TV show Cops? Yeah. Bad boys. Bad boys. <laughs> it's always a scene where somebody does something dumb and they're running from the cops. And the cops are chasing them down the streets. And then they try to hide in someplace silly, right? Like hide, hide behind a lamp pole. You know? <laughs> Hoping the cop doesn't see the cops come around, they got the dogs, and they and they capture them, or they get to them, and then the, the guy that they're chasing is like, okay, I surrender, I surrender. And they arrest him. Dang. The guy's not surrendered. He got caught. If he could keep running, he would keep running. And so there's a difference between being surrendered and getting caught. Don't let God just catch you. Surrender. You know, it says here, Jonah says something in his prayer, something very profound. He says, those who cling to worthless idols. An idol is anything that you turn to instead of God. Wow. Anything that you run to instead of God. He says, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Mm. Other translations say they forfeit the grace that could have been theirs. He wrote that. Think about that. Think. I thought, okay, what was Jonah's idol? What was he holding on to? Remember what I said, he was more loyal to his emotions than he was his calling. Mm. I think Jonah's idol in the moment was bitterness wow. and resentment that he was unwilling to deal with. He had to let go of that idol to accept God's call. For all of us, we have those things that we run to, those idols that we grasp, that we have to let go of in order to find life. I'm reminded of an illustration, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it to a close here. An illustration called the monkey trap. Mm. And it's a story that I heard of these hunters in Central America. And to hunt monkeys, here's what they do. They, they take a gourd, they dry it out. Which the gourd is like a pumpkin-like thing. And they dry it out. They, car they hollow it out. And they fill it with all these nuts and berries and things that the monkey would love to eat. And they tether it to a tree. And then all they have to do is walk away and watch the gourd. Because these monkeys will come and they'll realize that what they want is inside of the gourd. So they'll take... And they'll put their hand, and the other thing they do is they cut a hole that's just big enough for the monkey to put his hand into the gourd. But once his hand is full of the nuts and berries, he can't pull it out. So he'll go to this gourd, he'll stick his hand, get all these nuts and berries, these things that he wants. And then the hunters, all they have to do is come up and knock it over the head because the monkey refuses to let go of it and have life. And that's what an idol is like. It's like we put our hand in there, we, we got... This, we're clinging to it, as the scripture says, and we can have life. And Satan's coming, not God. Satan's coming to take you out. Wow. And all you have, God is life. All you have to do is let go of whatever you're holding on to and have life. Mm. And it's the monkey trap. You know, God is life. Satan wants to close us. And in closing, I want to remind us, God has an amazing calling mm. for everybody in this room. An incredible destiny. There's an incredible life, life to the full, as John 10 says, that's being offered to you. And all you have to do is decide to stop running, to let go of the worthless idols and answer the call. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24, the Bible says, run your race in such a way as to win the prize, the crown of glory. Let's run not from God, but to God. Let's run and accept and embrace the great calling that God has for each and every one of us and run towards the eternal prize, heaven. Mm. To God be all the glory. Yeah.